UFOs absolutely exist. Now, what's the next question we should consider? It's this. Do extraterrestrial life forms exist? What do you think? I firmly believe they do, with 99.9999999999% certainty, there's practically no room for debate. Now, when I say cosmic life forms, I don't mean beings identical to humans on Earth, but rather the very existence of life itself. So, what should we consider first? Two things. First, the minimum conditions required for life to emerge, and second, how many environments in the universe meet those conditions? Scientifically, what defines life? A life form must satisfy several conditions. The most crucial is possessing genetic information, DNA or RNA. Why is this important? Having genetic information means the ability to self-replicate, and if replication allows a previous existence to be reconstructed, we can define it as a life form. Additionally, metabolic activity must be possible, meaning the ability to absorb energy to synthesize or break down substances. These two conditions alone are enough to classify something as a living organism. For example, let's assume a very simple life form emerges. If RNA exists, it could maintain its own information. If it also gains the ability to replicate, this organism has a high likelihood of evolving into increasingly complex forms. Therefore, if even basic RNA or DNA and replication capabilities are confirmed early on, the development into advanced life forms is just a matter of time. Moreover, the universe is over 20 billion years old. There's plenty of time. On Earth, it took only about 4 billion years for single-celled life to evolve into modern humans. Once single-celled life emerges, the existence of life becomes an inevitable outcome. That's the conclusion we can draw. To be honest, we shouldn't base our thinking solely on higher organisms like humans or animals such as cats and dogs. Even single-celled organisms, bacteria, viruses and prions, can broadly be considered the most basic units of life. Of course, viruses carry genetic material, DNA or RNA, but since they cannot reproduce without a host, some scholars don't classify them as living organisms. The same goes for prions. Prions are made of protein but lack genetic material, which is why some don't consider them alive either. Of course, opinions are divided on this matter. In any case, even if we only have a simple single-celled organism with just RNA and the ability to replicate, we can say that life exists. So, under what conditions can such life emerge? When we look at Mars or Titan, what's the first thing we check? Whether water exists or not, water is essential. Until now, the standard has been searching for life similar to Earth's. Meeting this condition suggests that Earth-like life could exist. But this means that even without the conditions we've discussed, there could still be other possibilities for life to exist. Life that looks completely different from Earth's. So, the conditions we're talking about now are actually just the minimum requirements. The probability of life existing could be much higher within a far broader range of conditions. As I mentioned earlier, water is absolutely essential. The second requirement is the presence of organic material, substances that serve as the foundation for forming amino acids and carbohydrates. These organic compounds must exist. Now, are these elements actually abundant in the universe? Yes, extremely so. Carbon, hydrogen and oxygen are overflowing in the cosmos. All they need is the right conditions to combine, and that requires external stimulation. With just a few organic compounds and an external trigger, life could emerge. You might ask, that may be true in theory, but is it actually possible in reality? The answer is yes. It has already been proven experimentally. Miller-Urey experiment, conducted in 1953, when an electrical charge was applied to a mixture of methane, ammonia, hydrogen and water, 20 different amino acids were produced. The atoms making up ammonia, hydrogen and water are primarily hydrogen, which is everywhere in the universe. This experiment demonstrated that with just an energy input, like lightning, the building blocks of life can form. A planet with frequent lightning strikes would be even more favorable. Amino acids could arise more easily there. And as I mentioned earlier, once amino acids form, DNA and RNA1 can eventually develop. Of course, scientists didn't stop there. They naturally went on to verify the next steps. Follow-up research confirmed that amino acids, DNA, RNA, and even nucleotides can form naturally under the right conditions. So, in a universe abundant with hydrogen and carbon, if a planet has frequent lightning and a hydrogen-rich environment, 
The final requirement is simply a surrounding environment that allows these elements to evolve into life or achieve self-replication. This is why planets with these initial conditions, where the environment is just right, are referred to as the Goldilocks zone. It's a region where energy sources like lightning exist or where temperatures remain moderate. To maintain stable temperatures, a planet must be at just the right distance from its star, like our sun. If it's too close to the star, it would be scorching hot and all water would evaporate too far and everything would freeze. The just Goldilocks zone is that perfect distance where liquid water can exist on the surface, neither too hot nor too cold. And if within this Goldilocks zone there's hydrogen and carbon, which of course there would be, then the likelihood of life emerging is considered extremely high. Let's take a closer look at the key characteristics of the Goldilocks zone. In a star system like ours, Earth maintains a temperature range where water neither evaporates nor freezes, thanks to its distance from the Sun. Earth orbits at about one astronomical unit, which is roughly 150 million kilometers charm from the Sun. For stars similar to our Sun, this distance would define their Goldilocks zone. Of course, the exact range varies slightly depending on the star's heat output. Now, the probability of life existing in the universe largely depends on how many Goldilocks zones exist. Even if the chance of life emerging in a given Goldilocks zone is just 1% and 99% for no life, consider this. If there are our 10 planets, the probability that at least one of each harbors life would be 1 minus the 10th power of 0.99. Without diving into complex math, this already suggests that with just 100 planets, even simple life becomes statistically plausible. The odds aren't bad at all. But here's the thing. Our Milky Way alone hosts about 6 billion Earth-sized planets, with roughly 1 billion being rocky, as confirmed by NASA. That means a billion potential cradles for life in our galaxy alone. How many Goldilocks zones exist in space? Let's break it down. Scientists estimate there are two trillion galaxies, each with around 200 billion planets. Multiply that, and we get 400 sextillion planets in the universe. But not all can support life. They must be in the Goldilocks zone, where conditions are just right. About 25% of planets fall in this zone. So 400 sextillion times 25% equals 100 sextillion planets, but that's not enough. A planet must also be rocky, like Earth. About 50% of planets in the Goldilocks zone are rocky, so 100 sextillion times 50% equals 50 sextillion rocky planets. Now, let's go further. What if just 1% of these planets actually host life? 50 sextillion times 1% equals 500 quintillion planets. That means there could be 500 quintillion planets with life in the universe. Based on this calculation, the question, does life exist in the universe, itself becomes meaningless. The truly meaningful question is, how much life exists? Currently, scientists estimate that life could exist on anywhere from several million to billions of planets. Amazing, isn't it? Do you now understand why I initially said life absolutely exists? When calculated probabilistically, debating whether life exists is pointless. The important question is whether among these millions of life forms, there might be advanced life forms or intelligent life forms. It's easy to think only of advanced life forms when we say life, but even very simple organisms are what we call life forms, right? There would be countless numbers of just those kinds of life forms. And we call the places with conditions that could support such life Goldilocks zones. And these Goldilocks zones are also incredibly numerous in the universe. In conclusion, there are far too many life-harboring planets in this universe. Naturally, among them, the probability of advanced life forms existing is very high. And the possibility of intelligent life forms existing would also be considerably high, wouldn't you agree? People who deny the theory of abiogenesis and the possibility of extraterrestrial life often use a metaphor called the washing machine analogy. What they mean is this. Just as putting watch parts into a washing machine won't magically assemble a watch, life cannot spontaneously emerge in the universe no matter how much time passes. But this argument is completely meaningless. Why? Because we've already proven it experimentally. When we applied electrical sparks, simulating lightning to basic substances like methane and hydrogen, we actually observed the formation of amino acids. This is precisely what the Miller-Urey experiment demonstrated. 
If you think about it for a moment, you'll realize how flawed this analogy is. A watch has a predetermined outcome. It must be assembled exactly according to precise blueprints. But life only requires basic proteins at the beginning. There's no predetermined direction, as these proteins originate from amino acids. You don't need to create an entire watch all at once. Even the possibility of just two or three simple molecules coming together is enough. Once that initial connection happens, the process can progress to the next stage. Why? Because molecules inherently tend to develop into increasingly complex structures through gradual self-organization. They naturally form more intricate arrangements over time. Put simply, the washing machine analogy claims a finished product, like a watch, can't form randomly, but life doesn't require a finished product from the start. It progresses step by step, first stage, next stage, and so on. This is completely different from a washing machine where parts only break down. The analogy fails to grasp the vast scales of time and space. The washing machine in our imagination is a tiny space, but the emergence of life involves chemical reactions over hundreds of millions of years in a universe that's 20 billion years old. The spatial scale is incomparably vast, too. The problem is that our intuition can't comprehend the true scale of the universe, so we easily fall for such flawed analogies. Moreover, the washing machine assumes a uniformly random environment. But what about the universe? What about life? There are diverse environments and varying external influences, precisely what we described earlier as Goldilocks zones. In conclusion, this analogy completely misunderstands the scales of time and space. What began as a half-serious question, could life exist in the universe, has now reached the definitive answer, it must exist. Given the universe's size and the conditions for life's emergence, life is absolutely inevitable. In fact, I can confidently say life likely exists on hundreds of millions to billions of planets. Now what's the next question? It's this. Do advanced life forms, intelligent beings capable of thought, exist? We'll explore that more deeply next time. Goodbye for now, and don't forget to subscribe, like, and turn on notifications. Knowledge is power.